Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you playwright, poet, psychologist, conspiracy theorist, and not to be redundant, stand-up comedian, Robert Anton Wilson. I've uh, been living in Ireland for the last five years, and I just want to say it's great to be back in the land of the free, <laughs> and, uh, and the home of guaranteed drug-free urine. <laughs> when I was young, I read Kafka and Orwell, and I'm astonished that neither Kafka nor Orwell ever thought of a uh, situation in which guaranteed drug-free urine would be a commodity on the market. <laughs> That was, that was the first thing I was told about when I got off the plane in Newark. Uh, the people showed me the ads. Uh, guaranteed drug-free urine. They come from all, it's, uh, they have all these ads. They're in Penthouse and uh, Village Voice and lots of publications. They all come from the same post office box in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that is a severe puzzlement to me because I've been in Boulder. I've been in Boulder many times. I've been in Bolden and Boulder and Nederland and Denver and all around there. I don't see how they can find drug-free urine for 150 miles. <laughs> but then, uh, then again, I, I reread the ads and I noticed they, they, they don't say human urine. <laughs> how many of you have noticed that? You've got, you got, you got to read carefully these days. Uh, I don't believe they can find drug-free human urine in that part of Colorado, so I believe they're probably selling cow piss through the mayor. <laughs> well, Ronald Reagan said he would do great things for small business if he got elected, and uh, he, uh, he has created an entirely new small business, uh, selling cow piss through the mayor. That's what, that's what I think they're doing. <laughs> You know, the people who are being subject most uh, heavily to urine testing are government bureaucrats. The people least likely to be smoking grass, right? And yet, one of these days, one of them is going to be called in, and his boss is going to say, To Williger, your urine test showed no drugs, but it seems you've got foot and mouth disease, and we're going to have to put you down. <laughs> I'm not here to make trouble. I mean, I'm a, I, I grew up in this country, but I live in Ireland now, and I didn't come over here to make trouble. So I want to say I think Ronald Reagan is really a wonderful president, and uh, Nancy is a wonderful first lady. She's the one who thought up the urine testing, I've been told, uh, which reminds me one of... Uh, one of the local literary lights, he lives in Oregon, but that isn't far from here in American distances, uh, Ken Kesey, he has proposed that everybody should send a urine sample to Nancy every day. <laughs> I think that's a revolting idea. I think that, that is very obscene humor, and I'm totally against it. And I, hope, and I hope nobody here will do it. I just mentioned it to tell you not to do it. I don't want you to get the idea I'm urging you to do it. But on the other hand, if you have a lot of test tubes handy, and oh, no, 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 I, no, I'm not really, no, I really think it's disgusting and you shouldn't do it. But since Nancy is so obsessively concerned with the purity of your urine, maybe you ought to send her one sample a week at least. Maybe we need to order some test tubes. Ah, uh, somebody says maybe we need to order some test tubes. You can get them at any drugstore. Most people don't know that. Very easy to get them. You can also get the... Uh, empty capsules so you can fill with anything you want. You can get them at drugstores, too. I'm not telling you what to put in the capsules. <laughs> I, I, I'm an individualist, so I leave that up to you. I'm not a libertarian, really. I don't know why they invited me here. Um, I used to be a libertarian, but they had too many rules. <laughs> uh, there, is, uh, there is a great deal to be said for Ronald Reagan, though, seriously. Uh, I regard him as the intelligent entity's president. You'll notice how I avoided the human chauvinism of saying the intelligent person's president. I'm very careful about such semantic issues these days. One thing I know about the United States, you've got to be careful what words you use here. And, uh, and segregation is back in full force, uh, I, I've noticed. 
That's the, that's the one thing you notice coming back here from Ireland. Back in the 60s, like many other idealistic young people, I know you don't believe I was young in the 60s, but uh, I was comparatively young. When I look around how many young faces there are in this audience, most of you probably imagine dinosaurs still roam the earth back then. Well, <laughs> the FBI is taping me again. Ronald Reagan, uh, I was saying, is the intelligent entities president. Uh, I mean this in the same way I regard LBJ as the pacifist president. Uh, he started the wrong war at the wrong time in the wrong place, and he fought it with the most disgusting possible weapons, such as napalm, which reaches 1,000 degrees centigrade on contact with human skin. And uh, that war was so, uh, as J.D. Salinger would say, vomit-making. Uh, Salinger was a great writer. That's, that's, a, that's a word we really need in English. Nobody ever coined that word before Salinger. P.S. Salinger could have used it more often, of course, but it was J.D. Salinger who coined it. That was really a vomit-making war. And by 1968, a Gallup poll showed that 70% of the population were against the war. There's never been a time in uh, the history of this country where 70% of the people opposed the government on a basic thing like war. So I regard LBJ as the pacifist president, since he made pacifism so popular. In the same way, uh, in the same way, I regard Nixon as the anarchist president. After five years of Nixon, most people in the country have the same view of government that you find only in extreme anarchist literature, uh, far, far, far more extreme than libertarian literature. I mean, and uh, as a matter of fact, Nixon left a permanent, permanent legacy. You just have to go to the movies or turn on television, and you can see. Uh, back when I was young, uh, and I was young once, uh, back in the back in the 30s and 40s, you always could tell the villain in a movie because he had a laboratory smock on, uh, white a white laboratory jacket that is, that indicated that he was a scientist. When he wasn't when he wasn't in a movie, he was on television telling you these cigarettes are less harmful than the others, and. Uh, he always knew the villain because of his white smock, and the first thing he said was, the experiment worked on the rats. Now we must try it on a higher organism. Would you come in, Miss Smith? You know, the Lionel Atwell usually played him, except when Boris Karloff was playing him. But since Nixon, you know the villain in the movie because he comes in, he's wearing a business suit and a solid collar tie, and he says, I'm from the government. Now, everybody in the audience right away cringes with fear and loathing. You want to know why libertarianism is so popular these days? It's Richard Nixon. You should all, those of you who are not atheists, you should all say a prayer for Richard Nixon every day. <laughs> he created the image of government in which libertarianism can flourish. Uh, and anarchism flourishes even better. And in the same way, Reagan is the intelligent entities president. I still haven't slipped into saying the intelligent person, you notice. I'm not going to give way to human chauvinism. Uh, uh, Reagan has made stupidity seem de classe. Uh, uh, Nixon uh, had 18 minutes erased from the tape, but Reagan goes around with his bare face hanging out saying, I don't know what was going on in the White House. Did you know what was going on in your house that week? folks. <laughs> and a funny thing about the Reagan gambit, I don't remember what I was doing that day. Can you remember what you were doing that day? Most people think, no, I can't remember what I was doing that day. And so that seems to make sense. But put it in another way. Put it in a more realistic, existential context. Can you remember the last time you conspired on a major felony? <laughs> I, can. I remember every major felony I've been involved in. And I, I remember exactly the last time I got involved in a major felony. And if Reagan really can't remember when he conspired to commit these major felonies, then, uh, then what the Democrats say must be true. The guy is off his knocker. <laughs> but uh, what, what, what am I doing? I come to this country and I start bum, uh, bad rapping the president right away. Well, this is a thing uh, about living in Ireland. You begin to develop Irish attitudes. I, I was in a movie theater in Dublin recently, and in Ireland they have travel lots before the movies, just like they used to have in the United States back in the 40s. And in many ways, Ireland is like the United States in the 30s or 40s. And I get used to it. I have to sit through a travel log before I can see the movie I came for. 
I don't know why they make travel logs. I've never met anybody who, when I, and I, if I asked anybody, do you like the travel log? They all say, God, no. And yet they keep making travel logs. Uh, somebody must be making this. This is another conspiracy that's worthy of serious investigation. Why do they make travel logs? Nobody likes them. But they still show them in Ireland. And I was in the Dublin theater, and they had a travel log about uh, Glastonbury Cathedral. And it was narrated by Prince Charles. Uh, you know, you know Prince Charles, you know. Uh, he's married to Di. And uh, at the end of the film, Prince Charles came on the screen after we just heard his voice for 15 minutes. He came on the screen and pleaded with everybody to send money to the Glastonbury Fund to help rebuild Glastonbury Cathedral. And as soon as he appeared, before he even began his play, a Dublin inner city voice in the audience cried out, Look at the fucking ears on the booger! <laughs> The, that's the Irish attitude. To me. So, I have acquired some of that while I was since I've been over there. I don't know. All this, uh, all this bum wrapping of Reagan is rather unfair. Uh, I'd like to say a few words in defense of stupidity. Uh, stupidity has been around so long that it must be serving some evolutionary function. That's common Darwinian savvy. Uh, not, nothing lasts for long geological epochs that isn't serving some function in, in the evolutionary process. And look how much stupidity there is in the world. As uh, my spiritual leader, J.R. Bob Dobbs, has said, uh, you're all familiar with J.R. Bob Dobbs, I hope. We must have slack. We must have slack, yes. J.R. Bob Dobbs is the founder of the Church of the Subgenius in Dallas. And, uh, yes, uh, I was I was recently a guest on his radio show, The Hour of Slack. They, 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 they have an hour of Slack every every Sunday evening on Dallas Radio. And uh, uh, Slack is the goal of the subgenius. The subgenius must have Slack. But uh, somebody threw that in from the back about Slack and distracted me. What I really wanted to quote from Bob, praise Bob, praise Bob. Uh, this is a marvelous saying, this is the key to power, which libertarians aren't interested in, of course, except when they're running for office. But uh, the secret of power, J.R. Bob Dobbs has put it all in a nutshell. You know how dumb the average guy is, right? You all know that. Mathematically, by definition, half of them are even dumber than that. <laughs> Absolutely. Mathematically, it's got to be true. Uh, how do you think Rajneesh got uh, 93 Rolls Royces? So some people think uh, he got 93 because he was an admirer of Aleister Crowley. This is the pregnant moment in which half the people in the audience look confused and the other half chuckle mildly, having gotten that very obscure capitalistic joke. I throw in a few jokes just for specialized members so I can spot who they are. When I get to the drug jokes, I'll know who the pushers are. <laughs> oh, wait, I get a few drug jokes already, didn't I? Peptides, peptides. Well, let's, go. let's get to something serious. Have you taken peptides into your heart? Brothers and sisters, you need peptides. You feel let down. You feel the world isn't treating you right. You feel you've got problems you can't solve. You feel that you need something extra in your life. You feel your life is empty and meaningless. You need peptides, brothers and sisters. You just open your heart and take in peptides, and you will find the peace that passeth all understanding. Are you ready for peptides? Are you willing to accept peptides? Are you going to take peptides into your heart? Send money. And I'll tell you, I'll give you my address in a minute. I'll tell you where to send them. And I will tell you all about peptides. But meanwhile, I'll give you a brief hint. Um, I, I've been traveling through the South uh, for the last couple of months. I'm on, I'm on a lecture tour that I've been on for about three months now, and I've got one month to go. And I have been pressurized and depressurized and repressurized and depressurized. I have crossed time zones. I have gone from East Germany to Maui in one week and from Maui to Atlanta, Georgia in another week. I, I, and, uh, it's a, it's a fascinating experience. You find you can't build a reality tunnel. You can't create a consistent reality when you're traveling that fast. Everything turns into a blur.
But there is one thing that stands by me, brothers and sisters, there's one thing, that's peptides. <laughs> you know what peptides are? Uh, peptides are those little buggers that don't know whether they're neurotransmitters or hormones. Sometimes they act like neurotransmitters and sometimes they act like hormones. And if you've got enough peptides, you are doing fine. You don't get... Yeah, peptides, uh, neurotransmitters make the networks in your brain that make up memory and make the capacity for learning. Peptides select the realities you experience. I think that's worth repeating. <laughs> Peptides select the realities you experience. Everybody has their own private reality tunnel. If this was one of my workshops, I would do a couple of exercises to show you that you've got your own reality tunnel different than anybody in the audience. But since this is just a brief talk, you can come to my seminar two weeks from now in Seattle and I'll demonstrate that. Meanwhile, uh, what makes up the networks that hold the brain together and make consistency out of the chaos of signals that are bombarding us all the time? It's been estimated that we're receiving a hundred million signals every minute. The brain, yeah, the brain is processing all of them, but very few of them can be admitted to consciousness. The brain sends most of them down to the body to deal with, or it just, it just wipes the slate clean. Peptides determine which signals are going to be imprinted on the brain and remembered and become part of your reality tunnel, what you consider the reality outside you. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's outside them, even though the peptides are what's selecting it. And uh, the peptides not only select your realities, they turn into hormones or they act like hormones and they run all over your body and make you feel high. It's peptides that uh, have made you the person you are. And if you don't have enough peptides, you're leading a pretty miserable life. That's why you need more peptides. <laughs> Send, uh, How much? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, if I were really one of those fundamentalist creatures that I've been doing a bit of an imitation of, I would say, send the money and... Uh, but, uh, no, you produce your own peptides. Everybody produces their own peptides. The problem is, the problem is most of us don't know how to produce peptides. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, that was part of my defense of stupidity. And you know, the stupidest thing the United States government has done in my lifetime, I would say, in my opinion, by banning LSD research in 1966. That was the most promising area of uh, psychotherapy and unleashing potential creativity and creating basic behavior change that we had ever discovered in the whole history of psychology. I have a degree in psychology myself, so I have a right to be skeptical about it. Uh, psychologists don't know uh, shit, about <laughs> it, basically. Um, and, and all my years of studying psychology, I've only found one law that seems to me to be really true, and that wasn't in any psychology class. That was in a movie called The Magnificent Seven with Yul Brynner and Steve McQueen. And some of you remember that blessed movie, Praise Bob. Uh, there's a scene in there where Eli Wallach, as the head of the bandits, has captured the seven gunfighters who have been hired to defend these Mexican farmers from the bandits. He captures all seven of them, and he says, now I'm going to have to kill you. And it's really a terrible shame, talented men like you, so good with the guns, and I have to kill you all because you went to work for these dumb farmers. Why did you do that? Farmers are sheep, and sheep are meant to be sheared. Why did you get yourself into this terrible situation? And Steve McQueen says, well, it's like a fellow I knew once in El Paso. He took off all his clothes and jumped in a clump of cactus. And when people afterwards asked him, why did you do that, you damn fool? He said, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and when I saw that film, I thought, praise Bob, this, this is the one psychological law that really seems consistent. Uh, that's why people do most things. There are all sorts of complicated Freudian, Adlerian, Jungian theory. Why? But the main reason people do things is because it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> that, that's, that's why I agreed to do three lecture tours this year. <laughs> Peptides. <laughs> Peptides, uh, when they're acting like neurotransmitters, you are developing tremendous capacities to learn. If you're learning very rapidly, have you gone through periods where you felt you were learning a lot fa very fast? Have you had times when you had a tremendous burst of insight and you thought, my God, this is what Archimedes felt like when he cried Eureka and ran through the streets? 
that's peptides working as neurotransmitters. Your brain has reorganized on a higher level of coherence. You ever felt good all over without taking cocaine? <laughs> and it's really, really great swimming, you know? Uh, that, that's peptides. They, they work as both neurotransmitters and hormones. And uh, there are many ways of triggering the release of peptides. Uh, meditation is a well-known way, uh, well, well known in the Orient. Many people in the United States have taken up meditation in the last 20 years. If you get good at meditation and you start feeling higher than a kite and you think, oh man, I don't have to pay those horrible marijuana bills anymore, <laughs> you have learned how to generate more peptides. That's what you've been doing while you've been meditating. Another way of generating a lot of peptides is work that you really enjoy. Uh, there's uh, a look at Michael Hutchison's book, Mega Brain. I'm not making any of this up. I've been joking a bit, but I'm not joking about peptides. Um, if you're doing work you deeply enjoy, you're releasing floods and floods of peptides every day. I used to wonder, why am I so happy and, every, and most of the world is so damn miserable? What's wrong with them? I even wrote a book about it. I wrote a book called Prometheus Rising. Plug, plug, plug. <laughs> ah, somebody read it. And that was a, I was trying to explain to people how to, uh, it originally had a subtitle, which the publisher, due to absent-mindedness, left, uh, left out. The subtitle was How to Use the Human Brain for Fun and Profit. And that's what the book is about. And it was uh, my best ideas about how you can use your brain more efficiently. And that was because I uh, was grieved in my heart and sorrowful to see so much misery and suffering all over the world and people using their brains entirely for misery and suffering. And, uh, you know, some people, if you tell them it's uh, Wednesday, they say, oh my God, it's Wednesday, and they, they, they go into a collapse right away. Anything you tell them, you know, they, they find it's another cause for misery. And uh, that, that's because they, uh, they're just not producing enough peptides. They're producing a lot of adrenochrome and other negative chemicals like that. I, I, I finally found out uh, from this uh, recent research on brain chemistry, the reason I'm so bloody happy is that I enjoy my work. I sit down there at the word processor when I'm not on one of these lecture tours. I sit at the word processor for about 10 hours at a bat. My wife keeps saying, come and eat something for Christ's sake, you'll starve. Or, You're going to get eye strain again. Come on, and I'm, I'm still hammering away at the word processor. And you know why I'm doing it? I'm addicted. I'm addicted to my own peptides. I'm producing more and more peptides all the time. That's why people keep climbing mountains. Somebody gets to the top of the Matterhorn and they say, wow, what an achievement. And he says, I want to go off to the Himalayas now. I want to take on K2. That's because he's getting high on mountain climbing. Anything you really deeply enjoy produces peptides. And that's one of the best arguments for a libertarian society. If people could do what they really enjoy, they'd all be high and happy. And high and happy people don't go around making others miserable. <laughs> I have made a question. I have made a close study of the people who spend most of their time trying to make other people miserable, and my conclusion is they're all miserable themselves. That's why they do it. If you're high and happy, you have no need to make, no need to make others miserable. Uh, work you really enjoy, meditation. Um, it seems that a lot of popular recreational drugs are precursors of peptides. You're not really getting high on your favorite drug. You're probably getting high on the peptides that that drug triggers in your brain. Um, sex frequently triggers the release of peptides, which is why you find it very easy to remember your best sexual experiences. Uh, art that's deeply moving. Uh, if you've really been carried out of yourself uh, by you know, Beethoven's Ninth, perhaps, that's because Beethoven pushed your peptide buttons. And now there are machines to produce peptides. How many people have heard of these new brainwave machines? I got a terrible reputation back in the 60s for going around talking about psychedelics. Uh, but uh, now I'm not talking about them anymore because we got more efficient tools now. We got machines. And uh, some people tell me, don't go around talking about these machines. The next thing you know, the government will make them illegal, too. <laughs> well, it, it, seems there, it seems there are several million people in the United States using one type or another of brainwave machine, most of them uh, encouraged by their doctors. So I think it's too late to turn the clock back on that, and I don't think they will be made illegal. And besides, Americans have never been as paranoid about machines as they are about chemicals. 
So I think these machines are here to stay. If you want to generate more peptides, uh, get yourself an ISIS machine and you just turn it down to alpha. You just turn the dial. That's all it is. It's as simple as the television set. You just turn it to alpha and uh, the ISIS machine flickers alpha in your eyes and bombards alpha in your ears and your brain adjusts to alpha and all the endorphins and all sorts of peptides start forming and uh, uh, you'll find you're a much more creative person than you ever realized you were. Turn it down to theta and you'll get so creative that you might alarm your neighbors. <laughs> Uh, but I, uh, I seem to have digressed. Uh, I'm talking about becoming more creative, more free, uh, getting higher and happier, and I really started out to talk about the evolutionary advantages of stupidity, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, there's so much stupidity around, it must be serving a function. Voltaire said, the only way to understand what mathematicians mean by infinity is to contemplate the extent of human stupidity. <laughs> And uh, anybody who studied religious history will have to agree with that. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to let up on America for a while, you know, over in Iran they are governed by a man who believes he is in contact with Allah. Allah is a gaseous vertebrate of some sort of astronomical heft who dictated the Koran to Mohammed. And Allah is, uh, has a paranoid obsession with the sexual behavior of domesticated primates. And among other things that the Ayatollah has learned from Allah is that uh, divorce is so horrible that it should not be granted except in ex uh, extremely uh, few and specified situations. The Ayatollah has written a commentary on the Koran in which he specifies that if a man is in the habit of sodomizing camels, that does not give his wife the right to a divorce. Now, she might catch something worse than AIDS, uh, but Allah is very strict about divorce. Uh, however, the Ayatollah does say that uh, if a man is in the habit of sodomizing his brother-in-law, then Allah says his wife can get a divorce. Uh, so you see, the Ayatollah is a flaming liberal in comparison with the Pope. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Catholic teaching is that divorce is forbidden in all cases, and the Catholics, like Ayn Rand, are strict Aristotelians, so to them all cases means no case, or means all cases. Uh, in Ireland, where the Catholic Church is still in full power, uh, divorce is still illegal, and uh, a guy can sodomize all the camels he can find in County <laughs> Kerry and his brother-in-law too, and his wife still can't get a divorce. Because, uh, the Catholic God is even more against divorce than Allah is. And if you look at political history, you'll find even more astounding examples of the infinitude of human stupidity. Well, praise Bob, that's the secret of power, as Bob says. You know how dumb the average guy is? Half of them are even dumber than that, right? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's how, uh, you know, that's how Rajanish got 93 Rolls Royces. He grew up in India, in a small town in India, in the most impoverished part of the world, and he read in a newspaper when he was seven years old that Krishnamurti had gotten himself a Rolls Royce. Just by coming to the Western world and bringing Hindu wisdom to all the seekers in the Western world, Reason I'm ready to realize there's a seeker born every minute. <laughs> so, the, so, so Rajanish said, when I grow up, I am going to the Western world. And he came to the Western world, and he found there are even more seekers now than there were in Krishna Murthy's day. And he got himself 93 Rolls Royces. And you can do the same. Uh, I was talking peptides before. Now I'm talking cash on the barrel head. <laughs> Yeah, the subgenius church is doing better all the time just because Bob got caught in an elevator with L. Ron Hubbard in 1957. <laughs> and L. Ron Hubbard told him the secret of power, just as I have revealed it to you tonight, as Bob revealed it to me when I met him in Dallas on that blessed day. And uh, as H. L. Mencken said, nobody ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American people. <laughs> Uh, some people were horrified when they read, uh, I've been hearing this all through this tour, people say to me, didn't you get chills of terror when you read that the readers of the National Enquirer voted 15 to 1 that they'd like to have Ali North as president? And I said, no, I'd be surprised if the readers of the National Enquirer didn't pick Ali North. 
But <laughs> if, if it was a choice, if you gave the readers of the National Enquirer a choice between Paul Newman and Ali North, they'd pick Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm not here to try to revolutionize the Libertarian Party. They, are, they brought me here. They, they, I'm their guest. I don't want to make problems. But I think the Libertarian Party is a little bit naive almost as naive as the Democrats. You keep talking about issues, as if there are people out there who can think. <laughs> now, 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 you want to make an impact on American politics. What you want to do is persuade Paul Newman to become a libertarian and be your presidential candidate. He'd beat Ali North hands down. He'd beat anybody the Republicans or Democrats could find. Uh, the, 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 only, the only possible way the Republicans or Democrats or the socialists, for that matter, the only way anybody could beat the Libertarians if you had Paul Newman is if somebody was smart enough to get George Burns. <laughs> because, I don't know, most people really believe George Burns is God. <laughs> uh, do, do you know when somebody gets sick on a soap opera, people send in uh, get well cards? They have that little sense of the distinction between fiction and reality. When J.R. got shot, people were sending condolence letters to Sue Ellen. I saw, I saw Dallas in German recently, and that was an unforgettable experience. Can you imagine J.R. and Sue Ellen and Bobby and even the black servants all talking German? It gives an entirely different flavor to Dallas. I, I saw that in uh, Berlin. Um, when I went to Berlin, my wife made me promise I wouldn't go to East Berlin. She thinks I have, I'm too much of an adventurer. I don't know how she ever got that idea. <laughs> and so I promised her I wouldn't go to East Berlin. And then I found to get from, uh, from Bavaria to uh, Berlin, I had to go through East Germany. And you know what? It's even worse than you libertarians think. <laughs> really. They come on the train in the middle of the night and they wake you up and say, you are vapors, please. And they look just like the Nazis in the, those old war movies that I grew up on. You know, I couldn't believe it. They have the same expressions, the same accents, the same. they walk the same way. This whole mechanical man bit that Wilhelm Reich analyzed in the mass psychology of fascism. And when the train stops at a station, uh, they have secret policemen get off the train with Tommy guns and stand on the other side so nobody can get off the train on the wrong side and sneak into East Germany to do mischief against them. It is even more paranoid than Washington, and that's saying a lot. I, I got out of East Germany and I felt just like the hero of that recent film, Gotcha. Uh, any of you seen Gotcha? Yeah, when he gets out of East Germany, he turns around and says, Fuck you! That's, that's just the way I felt when I finally got out of there. But I did get out of East Germany, and now I'm back in the land of the free. And, uh, you know, back in the 60s, I was involved in the desegregation movement. Uh, not on sentimental grounds. Uh, I felt very pragmatic about it. I had the idea that if we didn't, uh, if this country didn't change radically in the matter of race relations, we were going to have an increasingly violent crime problem escalating to the point where in a hotel, in an average hotel, you'd have three locks and signs telling you how to protect yourself while you're in your room. Now, I know that sounds paranoid, but that's what it seemed to me was likely to happen. So I thought we needed to desegregate this country. And to some extent, this country has desegregated a bit. Uh, the blacks can sit anywhere on the bus they want now. Now it's the smokers who have to sit in the back. <laughs> and, uh, well... That's, that's primate psychology. One of my standard lectures is called How to Tell Your Friends from the Apes. And the point of the lecture is that it's pretty difficult in most cases. Uh, it's a basic feature of primate psychology that you've got to have an outgroup. Like, how many of you have ever heard of the Tinkers? My God, this is incredible. You probably know that Northern Ireland isn't part of Ireland, too, right? Most Americans tell me, why do you live in Ireland? Doesn't the violence frighten you? There's no violence in Ireland. It's one of the most peaceful countries in the world. The violence is in Northern Ireland. But most people can't tell the difference. Most people in this country don't know they're two different countries. And most people here have never heard of the Tinks, or the Tinkers, generally called the Tinks. Uh, they're, they're, that's a bunch of people who were dispossessed from their lands by Oliver Cromwell in the 17th century, and they've been on the roads ever since. And Ireland, which uh, has the honor of being the only country in Europe which never persecuted the Jews, as Mr. Deasy says in Joyce's Ulysses, because they never let them in. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, 
Actually, there are Jews in Ireland. The mayor of Dublin was a Jew a few years ago, and the mayor of Cork even more recently. Uh, yeah. But Ireland uh, is remarkably free of, uh, of the kind of racism you find in most of the world. That's because they have the tanks. Uh, these are these wandering vagabonds that were dispossessed by Cromwell. And they are called the tinkers uh, when they're 50 miles away. The government calls them the itinerants. And most people call them the tinkers uh, until they come within 20 miles, and then they call the tanks. And when they move in next door, they call the fucking tanks. <laughs> uh, so Ireland persecutes the tanks. Uh, it's, it's widely believed that they have all the deplorable characteristics that most Americans attributed to the Irish 100 years ago, and that were attributed to blacks 20 years ago. Now, as far as I can make out, there's no difference between the tanks and anybody else in Ireland, except they have less money. So every group has got to have an out group, and in the United States today, it's the cigarette smokers. And uh, so, so now the blacks can sit in the front of the bus, and the cigarette smokers sit in the back. And uh, I, I was, uh, I come into, a, you know, I, when I arrive in, in Ireland, people can smoke anywhere they want. I know that sounds incredible, uh, but uh, they're, they're a backward country. They haven't got civilization yet. And I come to this country, and I walk into a restaurant, and they say, smoking or non-smoking. I thought they were kidding, you know, so I said, uh, smoking, white, Protestant. You see, I was uh, <laughs> scared of me like I was crazy. Uh, I said, well, if you're reviving segregation, let me, I, I want smoking filtered only, white, Protestant, Episcopalians. And they said, no, no, we can't do that. It's against the law. We can only discriminate against smokers. Uh -huh. Well, every in-group has got to have an out-group. Uh, I... Um, I went out to the concierge a while ago. I wanted to mail a letter. He's got a sign on his desk that said, thank you for not smoking. So I said to him, thank you for not picking your nose. <laughs> <laughs> he, he gave me the weirdest look. I get mailings from the Friends of the Vanishing Malaria Mosquito. Have any of you got any of that mailings yet? This is a group that uh, they, they, I get on a lot of weird mailing lists. I probably have more copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion than anybody in the world. Uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is one of those books in which the alleged villains talk like the villains in an Ayn Rand novel, which is the kind of thing I can't believe for a minute because all the villains I've met in the real world say, we're doing this for your own good. And, uh, but the, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, they say, in order to exploit the Goyim further, our next sinister plan will be... <laughs> Nobody talks like that, you know. But I, I get on these weird mailing lists and I get things like that. And I get mailings from the Friends of the Vanishing Malaria Mosquito. And they are seriously concerned that throughout Africa and India and uh, Polynesia and parts of South America, the malaria mosquito has declined in the last 30 years at an alarming rate. It's one of the most endangered species on this planet. The places where there used to be literally billions, well, I'll do my Carl Sagan bit, billions and billions of malaria mosquitoes. Now there's five or ten left uh, in some of these areas. Uh, they, they may be totally extinct by 1992, according to the latest mailing. And these people, you know, well, you could just check it against the malaria rate. You find the number of people dying of malaria has been going straight down for the last 30 years. Hardly anybody dies of malaria anymore, which shows the extent to which the malaria mosquito has been persecuted, harassed, and, and murdered en masse by the heartless chemists and the, the chemical manufacturers who have no... Uh, no, no care for how much life they destroy. I get these mailings regularly, and I keep looking at them and thinking, is this a satire or is it for real? <laughs> and, uh, I can't tell because a lot of ecology magazines I get are just as nutty as that, but they seem to be serious. <laughs> Paul Krasner has been saying for 20 years, it's getting harder and harder to tell the reality from the satire. And when the president is going around saying, I can't remember the last time I conspired to break the laws, I, how can you tell the reality from the satire anymore? <laughs> I think uh, since uh, I was supposed to have a dialogue with Carl Hess, and uh, I came here prepared to uh, sit down and have Carl in the next seat, and I would say, uh, Carl, 
found any good window pane acid lately or something like that to get it done. But Carl isn't here, and so I'm on my own, and uh, I've been giving you bits and pieces of various of my standard lectures, and I could go on and give you bits and pieces of a few more of my standard lectures uh, or entertainments or whatever they are, but I think it would be... Uh, more amusing and enlightening if we had a question period until our time is up. Oh, wow, that didn't take long. I'd like to hear more about the conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, Somebody wants to hear about conspiracy. I'm not in uh, conspiracy theories. I'm not interested in conspiracy theories. I'm interested in conspiracy facts these days. Uh, I. I uh, Theories are peptide networks in the brain to hold facts together, to make models that will organize the facts in a coherent way, and these are dependent on the subjectivity of the person creating the models. And you can interpret uh, the facts dozens of ways. If you want to hear conspiracy facts, I'll spew out the, the latest conspiracy facts I have uh, picked up lately. Yeah. Okay, uh, in uh, Miami, Florida, there used to be a bank called the World Finance Corporation. How many people have heard of the World Finance Corporation? Only one? Oh, a few have, yeah. The World Finance Corporation got in trouble when the garbage men uh, reported to the DEA that they continually found large stems of marijuana plants in the garbage. Uh, rather finky garbage man, I must say. But the DA got interested and he put the bank under surveillance and he collected enough evidence to get uh, writ from a judge to do wiretapping. And he got more evidence and he finally busted the bank and it turned out this bank was the biggest drug laundromat in the Northern Hemisphere. They were laundering all the profits from, uh, uh, from the marijuana fields of South America and a large part of the cocaine uh, business too. And the curious thing is that the bank was also used by the CIA uh, as, a, as a fund for uh, deep cover operations. As a matter of fact, two directors of the bank were former CIA agents. A former CIA, that's, a, that's an interesting expression. Uh, uh, sometimes that means somebody who's left the agency, but when you join the agency, you sign a thing saying you'll be on call for the rest of your life if they need you. And so it's hard to see how anybody can truly be a former CIA agent. Usually it means somebody who's working on a project that the agency doesn't want tracked back to them. So the worst that the Walter Cronkite can say is a former CIA agent was involved <laughs> instead of the agency has been laundering cocaine money. Um, uh, the Royal Finance Corporation transferred the money from the cocaine industry and the marijuana industry to the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas which was owned by Archbishop Marchinkus and Robert, Roberto Calvi. Um, yeah, Roberto Calvi was the one found hanging from a bridge in London two years ago, no, more than that, five years ago, uh, June 18th, 1982. That was two days after I arrived in Ireland, as a matter of fact. And uh, Roberto Calvi was found hanging from Blackfriars Bridge in London where the rising tide had covered his dead body. Uh, that's the penalty and threatened in the first degree Masonic initiation for Freemasons who betray their fellow Freemasons, which suggests that Calvi was either killed by Freemasons or by people who devoutly wish us to think he was killed by Freemasons. Uh, 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 funny coincidence, I'm interested in coincidences as well as conspiracies. Funny coincidence, the day Calvi was found hanged in London, his secretary fellow was pushed out of a window of the Banco Ambrosiano in Milan. The Banco Ambrosiano owned part of the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas, and the Vatican Bank owned part of it, but part of it was owned by Archbishop Marcinkus personally, which is why they have so many writs out for him in Italy that he only comes out of the Vatican on Groundhog's Day. And if he sees a policeman shadow, he ducks back in, as you may have read, you may have read about that. Um, Licio Gelli was the uh, grandmaster of the Paidue Lodge uh, uh, Freemasons in Italy. Uh, Paidue is short for Propaganda Due, or uh, P2 in English. Uh, Gelli got to the third degree in Egyptian Freemasonry, the Grand Orient Lodge, which was founded by Cagliostro and uh, the Duke of Orléans in the 18th century and many people suspected of having uh, hatched the uh, French Revolution. Um, 
Jelly got to the third degree in Grand Orient Egyptian Freemasonry and then founded his own secret Freemasonic lodge called Pei Due, of which Roberto Calvi and Archbishop Marchinkus were members. And Calvi was found hanging from the bridge. Another member was Michele Sindona, who was the manager of Vatican affairs in the United, Vatican finances in the United States. Uh, Sindona was at uh, Nixon's second inauguration. Uh, he was later indicted for 65 counts of stock and currency fraud in New York and disappeared and then uh, returned saying he had been kidnapped and he was uh, indicted for faking his own kidnapping along with the 65 charges of stock and currency fraud. It turned out he had embezzled $55 million from his own bank before he sold it back to the Vatican Bank. Sindona was extradited to Italy to stand trial for murdering a bank examiner, and he was convicted of that, and then he was poisoned in his cell. Um, Licio Gelli, who set up the Pei Due Lodge, which uh, Sindona and Calvi and Marcinkus were members of, infiltrated 950 members of Pei Due into the Italian government, which is why three Italian governments have fallen in the last seven or eight years, because they keep finding more Pei Due members in their government. Uh, Jelly well, returned, uh, he was, when he was about to be indicted, he left Italy in a big hurry uh, because the secret police was infiltrated by his people too. The, the head of the secret police was indicted for being a member of the P2 conspiracy. Uh, he died while awaiting trial. The uh, deputy director of the secret police was indicted on the charge of conspiring in various bombings and stock and currency frauds and heroin and cocaine deals and he's still awaiting trial. Uh, so there were enough pay due people in the secret police that when the writ went out to arrest Jelly, he left Rome immediately and went to Uruguay, where he had a lot of friends like Klaus Barbie, whom he had helped uh, get false identity papers. One of Jelly's principal jobs uh, were, before he founded P2 was creating false identity papers for Nazi war criminals and getting them uh, gainful employment with the CIA in South America. Um, so he had lots of friends in Uruguay. He went to Uruguay, but later he came back to Switzerland to take some money out of a numbered bank account, and the uh, Swiss bankers recognized him, turned him over to the police. And the Swiss police are allegedly the most incorruptible police in Europe, which is what makes it rather astounding that uh, they were only able to hold Jelly for three days. They put him in a maximum security prison, and in three days he got out and went back to Uruguay. I was in Switzerland recently, and I was in Geneva. As a matter of fact, where Jelly just disappeared out of that maximum security prison in such an inexplicable way that the Swiss government is still investigating its own employees to find out how it was done. Now, I suggested they should put over the gate of that prison to make it a tourist attraction the three monkeys. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. <laughs> And in the best Gothic German script, Ficken sie nicht mit der Freimauerin. No. <laughs> Don't fuck around with the Freemasons. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jelly was at Ronald Reagan's inauguration, and you'll find in most books on the Pei Due conspiracy, you'll find a photo of Jelly and Reagan together at the inauguration. They both have big, friendly smiles. And they seem to be sharing some secret and private joke that the rest of us haven't found out about yet. Which may have something to, you know, you know uh, Nixon in the Watergate tapes, the most, most fascinating line in the Watergate tapes is the one that hardly anybody comments on. That's when uh, Nixon says, we better pay Hunt. Even if he wants a million dollars, but I know how to raise a million dollars. I can get my hands on a million dollars and we gotta pay him. He's threatening to blow the whole Bay of Pigs thing. Now the question is, what Bay of Pigs thing was there that we didn't know about in 1973? That Hunt could blow, whatever it is, we still don't know about it. It hasn't been blown yet because Nixon paid the money and Hunt's wife got the money and the plane mysteriously exploded, as you all know, destroying most of the evidence. But uh, whatever Hunt knew about the Bay of Pigs thing, Hunt was involved in the CIA at the time that Johnny Roselli and Sam Giancana and the CIA were starting to collaborate on the cocaine business, all of which flowed through the World Finance Corporation in Miami, went to the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas run by Pei Due and Archbishop Marchinkus, and then disappeared into the Vatican Bank, which is a financial black hole. That is to say that just like a cosmological black hole emits nothing that ever enters it, even light can't get out. 
uh, Vatican Bank, nothing ever gets out. The Italian government has no authority to audit their books because the Vatican is a sovereign and independent state. That's why they can't arrest Archbishop Marcinkus. He's not living in Italy. He's living in the Vatican, which is very cozy for him. Uh, now, okay, there's a few conspiracy facts. You make any theories you want out of them. Yes? I didn't want to interrupt you, but I want to know how this all fits with the trilateralist and the Council on Foreign Relations. Oh, well, you see, the trilateralist and the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, you know, now you want me to speculate. I, I will speculate as long as everybody in the room says uh, yes at the end of this question. Do you fully understand that I am speculating and that this is not proven fact? Yes. Yes. Okay. I will speculate. Pay Due, Pay Due is the tip of the iceberg, which is part of the age-old Italian conspiracy to control the Western world. Alan Watts said to me 20 years ago, the chief error of academic historians is the belief that the Roman Empire fell. It never did. It still, con it still controls the Western world through the Vatican and the Mafia. Well, Alan was exaggerating. It doesn't control the Western world. It's just trying to. Now, the trilateralists in the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Nelson Rucker, uh, David Rockefeller's attempt to control the Western world. And sometimes they work together with Pei Due and the Vatican and the Mafia, and sometimes they fight them. Meanwhile, Prince Bernhardt has his own conspiracy to control the Western world, which is the Bilderbergers, which includes David Rockefeller as a sometimes member. And so sometimes they work together, and sometimes they fight each other. And uh, then there is the Priory of Sion in France, which is the most delightful of all modern conspiracies. But if I try to talk about that, we, we'd uh, never get finished. Yes? I'd like to pursue your point that anything that survives over eons of geological time must be serving some kind of function. Does this idea also apply to the government and to God? <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I told you, I, I'm an individualist, uh, not a libertarian, so I don't have to stick to party dogma. Yeah, my, my feeling is we got as much government as we need. Uh, when, when we got more government than we need, there'll be enough opposition to drive the government back. I believe in the invisible hand. Uh, there's this uh, uh, Adam Smith uh, mystique that the invisible hand only acts in a free market, but I believe the invisible hand acts everywhere. And when the, when the government gets obnoxious enough in any place, any time in history, when it's obnoxious enough, there are enough people opposing it to stop it. When there aren't enough people opposing it, that means it's not obnoxious enough yet, and it's got to get more obnoxious. When it gets more obnoxious, it will produce the necessary opposition. So I see the invisible hand everywhere. So I don't worry as much as, other, as libertarians do. <laughs> Uh, well, you can make it dialectical if you want, but actually it's economic Taoism. <laughs> <laughs> it's based on the profound wisdom of Charles II of England, who said, the more you stir a turd, the more it stinks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? How about and bones, the Yale fraternity? Oh, that's a, that's a wasp conspiracy to take over the United States. I, I met a district attorney in California recently who uh, uh, told me spontaneously, without knowing any of my books, we just happened to meet at Esalen, and he told me that any city in the United States has at least 24 conspiracies fighting to take over that city. And that's just what I've argued in several of my books. Any, any sociological system, whether it's a city, a state, a country, or the whole world, you find basically 24 mega conspiracies fighting over the turf. And, uh, and if it's big enough, you find a few hundred minor conspiracies trying to get in on the fight. This is normal mammalian politics. It's been going on uh, for billions of years. Ah, yes? Which do you have ten most to blame the mess on, stupidity or conspiracies? Uh, stupidity. But uh, st stupidity and conspiracy are practically synonymous. <laughs> uh, uh, this district attorney I was quoting said something else. I, I, I left, uh, it amazes me when somebody who's been in a position of power agrees with me. Uh, I feel that's a deep confirmation of my suspicions. He said the most paranoid people in the world are the most successful conspirators because they know how easy it is to deceive people. They know how easy it is to double-cross people, and they know what's going to happen to them eventually, so they're constantly looking around, the godfather complex. Who's a coming for me with the gun next? And uh, um, 
the uh, uh, in, uh, when there was the rebellions in East Germany in the 50s, after they were put down, one government official said the people are going to have to work at re-establishing the confidence of the government in them. <laughs> and uh, Bertolt Brecht said, if the government doesn't trust the people, why doesn't it dissolve them and elect a new people? <laughs> In this country, there's a government that doesn't trust the people. They're tapping phones constantly. Uh, and in California, you can't even start a bank account without two pieces of identification now, which is incredible. I, when I was young, you could just walk in and say, I want to start a bank account. My name is Snively Waterford. <laughs> and you can start a bank account. Now you've got to have two pieces of ID. Uh, the American people are the most policed and governed and uh, watched and observed and snooped upon people in the whole world, which is why every time I fly the Atlantic, when I see the Statue of Liberty, I got to agree with Bernard Shaw, that must be the most ironic thing in the history of art, <laughs> that is standing at the entrance to this country. No place else in the world are they testing urine, you know. This is a distinctly American invention. Yes? Is the invisible hand working in East Germany and the Soviet Union? Yeah. Uh, that's why so many people are getting out of East Germany. That's the way the invisible hand is working in that case. That's why I get out as quick as I could. Knock out government. What about God? Oh, what about God? Uh, God is obviously serving a very important evolutionary function. Uh, it gets all the morons together in one place so we can recognize them and stay out of <laughs> Something big coming out of the Persian Gulf, <laughs> <laughs> a novel or a story that you might write or something. Am I going to write a no? I, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to write a novel about the Persian Gulf because I'm too busy uh, right now. I got with other writing projects. By the time I get around to the Persian Gulf, it'll be all over and nobody will be interested in it anymore. Uh, but it is—it's uh, typical of uh, the affairs of governments. It's. It's what keeps me in my firm faith in Our Lady Arise, uh, the goddess of chaos, discord, confusion, bureaucracy, and international relations. Yeah. Hail Eris, <laughs> yes. Is she, is she was the one who created the golden apple and wrote on it Callisti, which is Greek for to the prettiest one, and started the brawl on Olympus, which led to the bigger brawl, which became the Trojan War. <laughs> which led to the whole development of Western civilization as we know it, and the steady escalation of chaos, confusion, discord, bureaucracy, and international relations. And so, uh, hail Aris, and she's in charge. The best, we can, or the best we can do is just accept her and uh, figure out that eventually uh, the chaos and discord and confusion will create enough entropy that there will be uh, interstices in which we individualists can survive, especially if we move fast enough. <laughs> yes. Let's talk a little bit about LSD. Uh, Ken Casey said not too long ago that uh, the two drugs that he knew that had never killed anybody were LSD and marijuana. Is that that's to get a little serious? Is that in accord with your knowledge? Well, if you want me to get serious, no. You don't have to get serious. I'm no, that's not in accord with my knowledge. I think people have been killed by LSD and marijuana. People have been killed by uh, overindulging in mashed potatoes. People have been killed by aspirin. People have been killed by Valium. Uh, uh, I think Ken Kesey rather overstated the case. I, I would say that uh, marijuana, in my 30 years of experience with uh, marijuana and its users, uh, I think it's one of the most harmless drugs in the world. But some people will find a way to, to get themselves in trouble even with marijuana. And as for LSD, I have never, I've written a lot of complaints about the government for making scientific research with LSD uh, illegal, but I have never felt that LSD is a safe drug for anybody and everybody. I definitely think it's highly dangerous to some people, and it's, uh, it's dangerous to the very young and immature, and it, is widely, it has been widely demonstrated that it creates paranoia, anxiety, and disorientation in government bureaucrats who never try it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, compared to cocaine, uh, those things are really lovely. Uh, th th those things have done more good than, uh, certainly they've done a lot more good than harm in loosening up people's imprints 
freeing up their brains, releasing more peptides, and so on. Um, uh, cocaine, I don't know, uh, since the CIA seems to be, uh, the CIA and the Vatican seem to be making the most money out of cocaine, I am more willing to share my suspicions about cocaine than I used to be. I, there were years when I was afraid to say what I really think about cocaine because so many people I knew were heavily into it. But uh, now, nowadays I've got more courage and I, I want to, there has been a major scientific breakthrough recently. It has been definitely demonstrated. You can get exactly the same effects as cocaine by putting talcum powder up your nose, rubbing it in with sandpaper, and then running around the house burning all the money you can find. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you do that, if you do that for 30 days, the effects are exactly like a month on cocaine, especially when you look at your bank balance. <laughs> but as Richard Pryor says, cocaine is only nature's way of letting you know you've got too damn much money. Uh, yes? Yes, I was behind the Zion Curtain in Utah, and I was wondering if any of your researches on the conspiracy you've come across anything about the Council of Twelve Apostles and the Mormon Church. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I can't do anything with that. I don't know much about the Mormon church. All I know is that Joseph Smith got a divine revelation that polygamy was okay. And then the United States Army surrounded Salt Lake City and Brigham Young got a divine revelation that polygamy was no longer okay. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's about the sum total of my knowledge of Mormonism and its theology and history, so I can't go on much about that. Yes? I saw a future freedom uh, conference tape view in which you uh, mentioned that James Tiberius Kirk was one of your favorite fictional characters. <coughs> Same for me. I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about why you like it. <laughs> James Tiberius Kirk. Uh, very few people know that his middle name is Tiberius. As a matter of fact, it was never mentioned in any of the Star Trek shows. This may be absolutely apocryphal that he has that middle name, but it was on a Star Trek cartoon on an early, a Sunday, Saturday morning my kids were looking at. And they said, hey, Daddy, look at this. And I, oh, yeah, it looks like Spock. Oh, yeah, very, yeah it looks like Kirk. And, and he gave his full name as James Tiberius Kirk. He never, he never did that in any of the unanimated Star Trek TV. Or, um, yeah, okay, why do I like Kirk? Um, well, in terms of Leary's model of the nervous system, uh, we all have an oral bio-survival circuit, which is mainly concerned with how do I get fed and what dangers are threatening me. That's the most primitive part of the mind. And then we got an anal, territorial, emotional circuit, which has to do with how much space I can control and who am I on top of. And this in domesticated primates generally takes the form of who am I morally superior to. If you want to understand politics and the quarrels, and the bitchy little feuds that go on in all political parties, including the libertarians. Uh, just observe how many people are really playing the game of, I am morally better than you. That's such primate politics, putting themselves one up, you know. And then there's the third circuit, which is the semantic circuit, which is concerned with solving problems, making a map of the universe in the left brain, and then manipulating the universe with the right hand to see if the map fits, and then adjusting the map which is profoundly satisfactory to those who don't want to adjust their maps and would rather keep one static map forever. They, 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 they say she'd really cut off their right hand so they were never tempted to monkey around with the universe and find out if their maps work. And then there's the socio-sexual circuit, which has to do with orgasm, mating, reproduction, and the rearing of young. And all primates have these four circuits, and domesticated primates have surrounded them all with the most fantastic <coughs> mythology and systems of taboos, which is most of the comedy of human life. And in terms of Star Trek, Scotty is the bio-survival circuit. And Scotty is down there trying to make sure that the Starship Enterprise survives no matter what is put up against it, and always complaining that dilithium crystals are a bit low, Captain. <laughs> Bio-survival is always a little bit paranoid, you know. There's not enough energy. We, I'm not sure we're going to make it. <laughs> and then Dr. McCoy is the emotional territorial circuit, the moralist. That's not moral. I know what's moral. I'm a doctor. God damn it, Jim, I know what's moral. And I don't want to hear any more of this abstract reason from that pointy-eared Vulcan. And of course, Spock is the semantic circuit concerned with solving problems and can't understand all the emotional, moralistic trips that McCoy is always on. And Kirk is the sublimated form of the socio-sexual circuit. Kirk has never gotten married. 
although he's had a few affairs, uh, Kirk has sublimated the sexual circuit into love for the ship and its crew and desire to protect them. And uh, I guess I have uh, some kind of uh, adolescent, uh, still surviving admiration for that type of uh, person who uh, protects other people, cares about them, and is willing to risk his life for them. That's why I like Captain Kirk, in terms of evolutionary history. Besides, Shatner is a terrific actor. He gave Kirk a sense of humor, even before the script writers did. In the early scripts where Kirk didn't have a funny thing to say, Shatner made it seem funny by the way he said it. And then the script writers caught on and gave him funny lines. And uh, Kirk has always had more of a sense of humor than those people really usually have in real life. That's another reason I like Captain Kirk. Yes? I thought you had a question. No? Okay. No more? Qu ah, yes. Are you still uh, in contact with Tim DeMiri and do you still correspond? Uh, we see each other occasionally. We write letters occasionally. We may be working together on a movie in the near future, but that's still in the negotiating stage. Uh, uh, Tim is currently uh, working on a second computer game. His first computer game did well enough that he's got the confidence that he can do an even better one, and that, that will be coming on the market shortly. It's called Neuromancer, and it's based on the immortal novel of the same name, which hasn't yet won the Prometheus Award, but certainly should. Uh, yes? Doesn't it seem strange to you that although the protocols may well be a forgery and it may not be known who wrote them, that it does seem the world does seem to be following the concepts which are promoted there? Um, it also seems to be following uh, the general outlines of a lot of other paranoid forgeries, like psychopolitics attributed to Berea. Uh, another forgery that's gained wide circulation. Um, uh, paranoids are very good at describing what's going on. Their, their main problem is that they uh, make oversimplified theories about why it's going on. Uh, yes? Could you elaborate a little more on uh, what do you call it, an ISIS machine and why it's been described by doctors? Uh, the ISIS machine is invented by Jack Schwartz, who lives right here in Washington State. I forget in which city. Um, it uh, he has a pair of goggles and a pair of earphones and a little control panel. In the control panel, you turn the dial on. And when you turn it to alpha, the goggles start uh, flashing uh, lights at the alpha frequency into your eyes, and the earphones uh, bombard your ears with alpha. And so your brain, getting this double stimulation, goes into alpha. This has been demonstrated with electroencephalograms. Your brain does pick up the rhythm. You can measure it objectively on an EEG and see that you're in alpha. And anybody who has any experience at going into alpha will say right away, yeah, it's working, I can feel it. So you get both objective and subjective confirmation. And if you want to turn it down to theta, you go into theta. And that can be confirmed objectively and subjectively. And that's only one of about a dozen of these machines that are available these days that are making it more possible than ever before in history for us to take control of our own brains and program our own reality tunnels instead of just being uh, trapped in the accidentally imprinted circuitry of infancy and the conditioned circuitry that was laid down on top of that and the social programming that was laid on top of that. By and large, I agree with the behaviorists that most people uh, behave just like the rats in their laboratories. I disagree with the behaviorists that that's the way it has to be. I think we can reprogram ourselves. I've been writing books on that for a long time. I think, and I've been predicting this, this type of machine for a long time, too. And now these machines are appearing, and I think it's getting easier and easier to take over the programming of our own brains. Most of the effects you get with machines like ISIS or the Hemisync or the Pulse Star you can get out of the Lilly isolation tank. And even when people get me, even when professional paranoids get me in the state where I think, yeah, the government might ban these machines, they're just crazy enough to do that. I can't see a situation in which they'll ban the Lilly isolation tank. Anybody can build one. It's, it's ridiculous to try to control. And you can very easily get into alpha and theta with the Lilly tank. You can get into hemispheric synchro synchronization with the Lilly tank, too, if you use it often enough. So I think we are the first generation in history to really have the capacity to learn how to use our brains for fun and profit. 
And uh, most people throughout history have never known that. That's why they've used their brains for stupidity and misery. Uh, uh, what? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Two at one time. Let me try. What's the lily tank? It's a. Uh, it's a tank uh, invented by God knows who, but uh, perfected by John Lilly. He didn't invent it, but he perfected it to a great degree. It's a tank in which you are cut off from sight and sound. The walls are thick enough, and it's put into a room that's far enough from the street noises and so on. No sight, no sound gets in. You are blind and deaf, practically. And uh, there's enough Epsom salts in the water that you can't feel the effect of gravity. So you're free, and it's just like going into free fall. 85% of all astronauts and cosmonauts report experiences that are exactly similar to the Lilly tank, because going into zero gravity basically turns on a lot of alpha and a lot of theta and frequently an outburst of delta, too. And delta waves are connected with artistic creativity, and I'm sorry to tell the rationalists in the house, they also seem to be connected with those damnable things known as ESP and precognition, which we all know don't exist, but people continually have the hallucinations that they do, especially when they go into Delta. And what was your question? Where do you find these machines? In Edmund Scientific Catalog? Um, <laughs> Uh, these machines are getting more and more readily available, but the There's easiest no uh, the easiest thing to do is uh, uh, get Michael Hutchison's book, Mega Brain, and write to the address on the last page of that book, and uh, they'll, they'll tell you where to get the machines and what the prices are. New ones are coming on around all the time, and uh, they're getting cheaper. I, I ran into a guy in Dallas three weeks ago who... Uh, after reading Mega Brain, went home and designed his own brainwave machine, and it cost him nineteen dollars. Yeah. Out of parts he found at Radio Shack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm familiar with his works. It's very hard to get acquainted with him personally, it seems. He's one of the most reclusive individuals on this planet. I managed to get him on the phone once, and he said, I don't like talking on the phone. It's like talking in the dark. And that's about all I got out of him. He, he's, he's not a very sociable person, I gather. You have encountered your ideas in Timothy Leary's books somewhere, because I read his latest book, The Jacob Cooking, and I said, there's a cross representation oh, yes. here somewhere. <laughs> oh, uh, very definitely. Uh, he, wrote a, he wrote a very nice review of one of my books, and uh, he's aware of my work, but then he's influenced me, too. It's, uh, it's all a big, vast synergy. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Yes, uh, I have read a book, uh, some books by another Wilson. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you've heard of him, F. Paul Wilson? I've, I've, I've really liked the book. Yes, uh, uh, the first Prometheus Award, they asked me to present the Prometheus Award, and the winner was F. Paul Wilson, and everybody was joking about, uh, there must be some conspiracy here, one Wilson, <laughs> one another Wilson. Yeah, I, I, uh, I like uh, his books, especially Wheels Within Wheels. Uh, you tended to make fun of smokers, but I don't know if you're aware of the fact that there was a survey out and it showed that nine out of ten men that tried camels preferred women. <laughs> uh, I wasn't making fun of smokers, I was making fun of militant anti-smokers, but uh, that reminds me of the old Dublin joke, what's an Irish queer? An Irish queer is somebody who prefers women to Guinness. <laughs> I, think, I think you have to live in Ireland to really appreciate that joke. Uh. What are some of the projects you're working on now? Mm. I've been on a lecture tour for three months and I've got a month to go. And I don't know what I'm going to be working on after the tour is over. If the movie deal comes through, I'll be working on that. If not, I'll be writing the third volume of my historical series. Uh, I hope that comes through, but I'm not at liberty to talk about it. Uh, the, uh, I have two more books coming out uh, that are already finished. It's just a matter of the publisher. Uh, um, uh, 
laying off the uh, grass long enough to remember that uh, the type is set and it's time to start printing the books or something <laughs> like that. Uh, uh, they will shortly appear, Wilhelm Reich in Hell, which is a play uh, that I wrote, which has been done in Dublin and will probably soon be done in New York. And that has a long a comic, a long, very witty introduction by myself because I read Bernard Shaw and he said people don't buy plays, but if you write a funny introduction, they'll buy the play in book form. So I wrote a funny introduction. I worked for sure. I figure it might work for me. And the next book I've got coming out is called Coincidence, and that's a book of essays about uh, literature, quantum mechanics, E. Jing, and uh, various other things that obsess me. It also has some poetry. And it, I, I developed, uh, Mark Twain, when he took over the Nevada Sun, promised he wouldn't print his own poetry unless he developed a spite against his readers. Well, I must have subliminally developed a spite against my readers because I've started slipping my poems into my books lately. Coincidence has even more of them. Be warned. Yes? Speaking of your books, I've just purchased a copy of Natural Law, or Don't Put a Rubber on Your Willy. I wonder if you can give me a one or two sentence introduction to what I'm about to discover. It's a comparison of the theories of natural law held by the Vatican and certain uh, uh, ideologists who claim that they are libertarians but are eager to legislate what's right and wrong for the rest of us. And I am arguing that they can't know the concrete specifics of 10 minutes of your life, much less your whole life, so they can't legislate what's right and wrong for you. That's a, that's a nutshell summary of the book. What did your Irish environment provide you that you didn't find in this Um. Ireland is peaceful and nonviolent, and the people trust one another. If the, the coal man comes and I say, gee, I don't have any cash, I'll give you a check, he says, oh, faith, don't bother with that, I'll collect next week. I don't imagine anybody, any tradesman in the United States would trust you for a week nowadays. Uh, people trust one another, they're kind to one another. Uh, they're all dogmatic Catholics, but I can put up with that because most of the world is crazy anyway. And, uh, no matter where I go, I'm surrounded by crazy people, so I, I'll accept the, the quiet, peaceful, kindly crazies in preference to the violent, bloody, murderous crazies in this country. And uh, they got a uh, health insurance uh, plan there which will horrify all libertarians because it's run by the government, but it uh, costs me the equivalent of about a dollar a day in American money to get complete health coverage for my wife and myself, and I couldn't get a plan that cheap in the United States. And also, I live there for sentimental reasons. They don't tax writers, and I'm sentimentally attached to my money. <laughs> I can't see any link between that, but that's one of the that's one of the things that has uh, been perplexing me for the last couple of years. How come there are so many Freemasons in Ireland when it's a 95% Catholic country, and yet every city in Ireland you'll find a Freemasons hall? And that reminded me that when I lived in Mexico, I uh, read in the newspaper that the president of Mexico was a Freemason, and he was a Roman Catholic too. You got to be a Roman Catholic to be president of uh, Mexico. And then how did Pei Due get so strong in Italy, which is another Catholic country? I haven't figured that out yet. It shows that somebody, I think the Catholic uh, hierarchy was trying to use the Freemasons, and the Freemasons are trying to use the Catholic hierarchy, and one party in that is being terribly deceived. <laughs> but I'm not sure who. Do you think uh, P2 or Marcin was killed uh, John Paul I? I think it's possible, but I don't think David Yalla proved it in the book he wrote. He just showed that it was likely, but he certainly didn't prove it. And I don't think it ever can be proven because there's just no way the Italian government can get those people out of the Vatican to put them on trial, even if they wanted to. So that'll remain forever a mystery, like the Kennedy assassination. I was on the grassy knoll a few weeks ago. After all these years of speculating and pondering, I finally got to Dallas and went to the grassy knoll. 
and you will all be happy to know I put a Bob Dobbs head on the fence there to puzzle future <laughs> conspiracy investigators. <laughs> and standing on the grassy knoll is uh, fascinating. You look up at the window where Oswald, allegedly acting alone, fired the shots, and all you can think of is why did he wait so long? Uh, the car comes down Main Street, he's got beautiful, uh, beautiful chances all the way down Main Street. It turns in front of the school book depository, plenty of chances. Then it heads down Elm Street and he still doesn't shoot. It gets to the triple underpass, it's about to disappear. And then we're supposed to believe he fired three shots in, uh, faster than most professional marksmen can and, uh, and didn't miss even though he was a lousy marksman when he was in the Marines. Now, looking at the geography is the most convincing argument to me that Oswald didn't do it alone, aside from the uh, acoustic testimony of the experts uh, hired by the House Select Committee on Assassinations who concluded that the echoes indicated there were two, two, uh, two people firing from two directions. So actually what happened is the businessman in Fort Worth did it. They picked the ugliest building in Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I'm still waiting for somebody to propose that Jackie did it because she wanted to marry Onassis. <laughs> every, other, every other theory has been put forth, and yet nobody has had the hot spot. I may have to write that one myself. <laughs> else to... Yes? Uh, have you uh, met Ron Hubbard, Dale Ron Hubbard, and uh, what did you talk about? No, I haven't met. I've met Bob, uh, and Bob met L. Ron Hubbard, but I haven't met L. Ron Hubbard myself. I'm sorry to say, but he certainly knew the secret of power. <laughs> uh, see, I, I explained that before. Uh, how Rajneesh got his 93 Rolls Royces and so on. To put it in simple vernacular terms. A disciple is an asshole looking for a human being to attach itself to. <laughs> and uh, L. Ron Hubbard figured that out very early on, just like Bob Dobbs has. Praise Bob. <laughs> okay, three more questions. Yes? You mentioned in passing uh, that meditation was another way to accept uh, Do you have any comment on the GM movement? Um, well, okay, I'll, uh, I'll stick my neck out again. Uh, yeah, TM I think is a wonderful technique. I've used it for many years and uh, I find it very profitable. On the other hand, I don't have much uh, veneration for the TM organization which charges people outrageous rates under the pretense that one mantra is better than another. Um, uh, a mystic I do tend to trust because he has such a shady reputation, Alistair Crowley, uh, said that he experimentally determined for himself that one mantra is as good as another. And uh, that has uh, tended to be confirmed by EEG readings in which the scientists who have been studying yoga for the last 20 years, uh, seeing how it affects the brain, have indeed found that people, no matter what mantra you give them, if they repeat the mantra long enough, you get the same changes in the brain waves. And so I think TM is a wonderful technique, but I don't have any faith whatsoever in their claim that one mantra is better than another and you should pay vast sums of money to get your own special mantra. My question was uh, not with regard to that, but with regard to the spread of Oh, I think it is. I think the, I think the more people uh, learning to meditate is uh, part of learning how to use your brain uh, properly. If you can't meditate, you're, you're stuck continually in the beta state, which tends to produce adrenochrome, adrenalutin, and other dreadful chemicals which tend to produce paranoia if you stay in that state for enough years. You've got to get out of the beta state occasionally or you'll end up like Nixon. <laughs> Yes. Did Wilhelm Reich uh, discover an alternative form of energy? I've been I've been asking myself that question for thirty years. I'm not sure. What I am sure of is that uh, burning Reich's books was not the best, uh, most rational approach to solving that enigma. Did he discover a new form of energy, or did he just discover side effects of a known form of energy? I don't think Reich was hallucinating all the time because there were plenty of other people involved in his experiments. 
and involved in orgone uh, therapy since his death. I think something real is going on, but I don't know. I'm not quite sure what it is. I, I, I think when you reach uh, certain levels of brain functioning, it feels like there's a new energy, but it just uh, it may just be a chemical change in the body rather than an energy in the sense that electricity is an energy. Well, you, you've just, you have a, a rather positive attitude towards Reich, but a rather cynical attitude towards L. Ron Hubbard. What's the, what data have you collected to support <laughs> these uh, attitudes, or is it just sort of flip the coin? Um, I don't have a very positive attitude towards Reich. I think he was uh, rather paranoid towards the end of his life. I, I think that uh, a lot of the experiments Reich did are very interesting, and I'm especially interested in the people who repeated the experiments and got the same results. I'm even more fascinated by the establishment scientific community that hasn't repeated the experiments and says we know a priori that this is nonsense. I don't understand how you can know a priori the result of an experiment. And so that's what keeps me interested in the, the Reiki and controversy rather than Reich's own rather unfortunate personality. As for Hubbard, I think he was even more paranoid than Reich and didn't do anything of value compared to what Reich did in the way of scientific work. Well, he made lots of claims. Oh, well, he made lots of money. Do you know anybody repeating his, he his, made lots of money. his, uh, his experiments or his seances or whatever they are? Um, and disproving him or proving his claims? All I know is my own experience, and my own experience is that uh, people who have been through Scientology tend to come out rather be zombified, as I perceive them. They appear be zombified to me. They appear more robotic than when they went in. <laughs> and so I don't have any faith in that uh, system at all. <laughs> Objection registered. May I ask if you are a robot yourself? Or <laughs> <laughs> a, robot, a, robot, a robot rights activist. Well, uh, what's the doesn't know these days. Uh, there's a fellow named Peter Beater. And some people think I invented him. I, I, they think he's a character in, in one of my novels. He isn't. Peter Beater really exists. Now, he puts out a little journal called Conspiracy Newsletter. Now, he claims that the KGB has been murdering American politicians for nearly 20 years and replacing them with robots. <laughs> and, uh, he claims that the attempted assassination of Reagan was not an attempt at all. It was successful. They actually assassinated Reagan and they replaced him with a robot. And my question is, how could anybody tell the difference? But, uh, but uh, I don't want to be too hard on Peter Beter because my feeling is that anybody, any man who had the name Peter Beter would be pretty weird by the time he got out of high school. <laughs> But, you know, like all, like all weird theories, I think about it every now and then. All the theories I make fun of, I stop and think about occasionally. Maybe I'm making fun of the most important breakthrough of our time. And so there are times I stop and think, maybe there are robots around. And I start looking, and, yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe Reich did discover a new energy. Uh, maybe, uh, yes. Uh, Regarding the robot question, have you ever ridden the New York City subway during the morning rush hour? <laughs> yes, that's what persuaded me to leave New York. <laughs> well, I think we have uh, gone on long enough, so I think it's time we... Uh, uh, those, of you, those of you who live in Seattle, there are leaflets over on the table in the corner there telling you when I'll be back, which is about two weeks from now. Are you coming to San Francisco? Not on this tour.